You're tuning in to the Investors of Change with your hosts, Rizfiz and The Big Lebowski. For more insights on content similar to this video, feel free to subscribe on YouTube or follow on Twitter. The views on this video are opinions shared and not investment advice. Remember to do your own due diligence. Hi, everybody. Adam and Jacob here bringing you this video in a new series we like to call Coffee and Food. Uh, coffee because we invite a guest inside our space and enjoy a cup of coffee together. And food because the subject we'll be discussing today is the ticker food, which is the Good Food Market Corp trading at the TSX. If you've been following our channel, uh, our YouTube channel, Investors of Change, or if you've been following Adam or I or on Twitter, you'll notice we are both investors in, in food. And we enjoy chatting about food um, wherever we can, as much as we can, and as often we can. And chatting is exactly what we'll be doing today. And speaking of, Adam, how excited are we today to have our first guest on on, uh, on coffee and food? Yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting guest. Uh, he's a professional investor uh, out of the UK and goes by Jimmy. His Twitter handle is uh, DZ. Uh, it's D E E Z E E 1031. And that's the local butcher on Twitter. He's full of wit and a uh, wealth of knowledge. And we're really looking forward to picking his brain. Cool. And, and excellent. Uh, Adam. And, and I think what, what um, before we bring Jamie in, what is really, I'm really looking forward to, to learning more about is that you and I have been discussing food a lot from a, from a private investor point of view. And, uh, and today is a really cool opportunity to chat with a, uh, with an industry uh, uh, and professional investor who uh, who, pro who maybe views the case or views, views uh, food from a dis different perspective than the two of us uh, does. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, me, I'm, I'm, you know, private investor, but also kind of like a daily user of the products. Uh, you are somebody, you know, who is an investor and kind of uh, watching from a distance in uh, Denmark. So it'll be interesting to see the views of an investor from uh, overseas in, in the UK, for sure. With that said, uh, Jimmy, welcome to the show. And why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, it's, it's good to be on your show. I, I appreciate the invite. Um, it's um, really good to speak to you guys both live. We've obviously been exchanging messages before discussing good food um uh, and so um yeah i'm delighted you know thanks very much um, um as uh, as as adam and jacob said i am a professional investor i am based in the uk um and i i run a hedge fund um um uh, we you know we, we you know we, we tend to you know we're not one of those sort of you know short-term tradey hedge funds that do you know buying and selling all the time. We, we tend to focus more on running a, a fairly concentrated portfolio of, um, of companies around the world. Uh, you know, we, we don't really have many investments. We only have, you know, let's say 15, 20 single name investments, um, you know, a couple of shorts. Um, and, uh, and we tend to, yeah, and we tend to be very fundamental. Um, and Good Food is one of our holdings. It's been one of our holdings for um you know for over a year now and it's a meaningful part of our portfolio and we also have a meaningful stake in the company and um yeah i'm delighted you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm at your disposal um you know over, over the over these months uh you've you've provided a lot of value to me by um uh you know by discussing and showing the products uh on, on you know the grocery products um and also you know kind of your insight your local insight and your local knowledge of canada retail has been very interesting and, and useful um, and so I just, I just need to say that you know none of what I say is investment advice uh, everything I say is just my personal opinion in this case um, so you know please do your own research your own due diligence um, yeah let, let's 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 get on with it guys yeah great Jimmy thanks a lot for that and um, before we dig into the great presentation there by yourself, Jimmy, um, Adam, what, by the way, what sort of, uh, what are you having to drink right now? All right. Yeah. So this is coffee and food. So 
I made sure to, to make myself a latte. Uh, I have a, a cup here from a, a local roastery called Hale Coffee in Toronto, Ontario. And uh, it's like a single origin Colombian uh, roast, um, a medium roast. What about yourself? Great. Well, um, I went out to dinner like one hour ago and I had a lot of uh, fatty food, so I couldn't drink anything with milk. Uh, it felt wrong right now. It's also quite hot in Denmark right now during the summer. Uh, so what I'm having is I'm just having an America Americano. It's based on a, on a bean from Brazil and from, the, from my local roastery, which has a very good Danish sounding name of all these letters you cannot pronounce if you're outside of Denmark, but it's Nørsnil Café Restery. Um, and that's what I'll be enjoying today. And Jimmy, as far as for you, uh, that goes, uh, you're, uh, you're not to coffee right now. It's, uh, it's evening time in where you're located in, in London as well. And what is it that you're drinking, Jimmy? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm having a beer. Uh, I'm, having, uh, I'm drinking uh, Messina, which is a, uh, a really nice um, Sicilian uh, Italian uh, wager. Um, so I'm unwinding it. I've had, you know, had a long day. Uh, so I hope you don't mind me uh, having some alcohol. Yeah, sounds sounds great. And uh, references going down to Sicily. That's also not a bad place to to be in mentally. But uh, exactly. but, Jim, but Jimmy, if we if we start digging into it, actually, a good follow up from uh, from your introduction as well. You said uh, in the fund that you're managing. You've been uh, you've been long into food since uh, mid 2020. It sounded like. Could you elaborate a little bit on uh, how is it that you came across uh, food and why is it that it uh, ended up in, in your fund portfolio? Yeah, of course. Sure. Look, I, I, let me just let me just start by you know, taking a step back and, you know, just, you know, giving a little bit of, um, of color on, you know, sort of what is it we kind of tend to invest in. And so we, you know, we essentially we're, you know, as a fund, we, we tend to be quite, you um, agnostic in terms of style we're not trying to be value or growth or or garp or uh, or momentum we, we just we're just pure fundamental investors and we're looking for cases of um cases of very extreme asymmetry where you know if we're right uh, on our fundamental judgments and our fundamental call we can you know earn at least a 25 percent irr uh, on our investments and if we're wrong we don't lose very much money if we own the, the stock for a couple of years and so uh, some of our investments would fall into the category of value. Some would be very growthy. Some would be quite garpy by style. Um, but the reality is that, you know, we, we simply try to get an idea of a fundamental value of a company. We, uh, you know, we build out a few possible scenarios and attach some probabilities to them. And, and then, you know, we try to see what, what's our expected value uh, for each stock. Um, um, you know, we have a pretty hurt high hurdle rate and as I mentioned we have you know just a handful of investments we you know our portfolio is very concentrated it doesn't it doesn't actually churn that much um, um, and so and so today we have investments in different parts of the world we have some in Asia in Europe and Latin America of course North America some companies are very large companies some companies are very small companies good food is towards the lower end of the market cap spectrum of what we own um, and so, um, good food. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, we're, we're a global fund in principle, we have a very broad universe of stocks that we can invest in, but in reality, we tend to narrow in on a very limited number uh, of companies. And, 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 and so with good, good food in particular, um, you know, as, as he, you know, as he pointed out, you know, we, I, we've discovered it, um, just over a year ago, sometime, you know, kind of early to mid 2020. And this was, kind of you know during closer to the worst part of the pandemic and um you know the way we discovered it is it was actually completely random which is you know we did a scan of global businesses that were working on online groceries and food delivery um and we tried to have a look at um you know kind of what what's out there you know there are several companies we've known for a long time like like ocado uh in the uk mm -hmm. um there are other companies which are the food delivery takeaway delivery companies that um, I've sort of followed for a number of years, including when some of them were private companies like Delivery Hero, um, mm. and um, and and just randomly came across Good Food. Uh, was kind of intrigued because, you know, at the time Good Food was predominantly a a, um, a meal kit subscription business, and I didn't used to be a fan of those. I didn't. I, I never used to be a fan of of this business model. 
Um, although obviously, you know, the evidence now shows that I was wrong, but um, what intrigued me, what, what really struck me by Good Food is, is when I started researching the company and I started reading through their materials and I listened to some of their historic conference calls, I was really struck by, I was really impressed by the management and how they thought about the business. Um, and, um, and that really prompted me to go deeper and, and spend more time researching them and understanding, well, what exactly, who are they, what are they trying to do, how, what is, are they trying to build and how are they trying to build it? And, and, and my initial impression of, of them having a really interesting vision um, of them being long-term owner, you know, of them being long-term owner operators um, with a focus on building their business with, with a long-term shareholder value, um, was, you know, kind of really struck me. You know, they have, they're, they're building a business with a real interesting culture, a real good culture. Um, and I thought that their strategy makes perfect sense and it, it's very rational um, and yet very ambitious. Um, and so it's just it's just those qualitative elements that really struck me about good food. And so, of course, you know, we then spent a lot of time um, researching the, the company, going back through um, kind of the years um, that they were building up the milk kit business and how they pivoted and how they tried to uh, come up or how they came up with the idea of going into groceries and building a private label business, which 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 actually started, as you as you guys know, before. The, the pandemic started um, mm. um and so um yeah i was really really impressed by them and so you know one of the interesting characteristics is is, is basically these guys you know is, is this is, is this kind of this, this duo of uh founder managers uh jonathan and neil who um you know they both founded the business they're both significant equity shareholders and they've been kind of essentially running the company one is one as a ceo one as a chief operating officer and one is more of a sort of strategist. The other one is more of a hands-on operations guy. And they they work really well together. They execute flawlessly, and they've executed flawlessly. And um, and um, and that, yeah, that really struck me. And so that's kind of how how you know we started about it. And so we we did a lot of work, and we tried to understand the business. We tried to understand the market, uh, the opportunity. We tried to um, we obviously you know spoke with the company and 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 tried to um, you know get as much as, as many of our questions answered, and and then we tried to assess the optionality of what is it they're trying to build in the grocery side, and it was pretty impressive. And so. We started building a small position initially, and then over these months, over the course of the last twelve months, we've been essentially just adding, um, adding to our holding. Um, um, you know, especially as our thesis uh, appears to have to be uh, to be working so far and working pretty well. And so, yeah, you know, just very very happy we found good food. It's um, it's it's one of those, you know, hopefully it's going to be one of those. Um, uh, kind of interesting, you know, little little companies that grow up to be a, a, a very large, very successful, profitable business. Your insight here, Jimmy, really sounds sounds lovely to to listen to and and sounds um, like sweet sweet music into our ears. Um, it j just for you to elaborate a little bit because you came on board in mid twenty twenty, and um, it sounded as if your your uh, initial entry with the, with the scanning of, of of you could say the market where, where food popped up in in in, in your site it sounded as if you were you were industry focused that you were you looking for something that was food related and then you came across food was there ever at any point in your from your uh, the position you started with and the position you built during autumn 2020 where where you considered the fact of uh, of the covid play theme there was around a stock like uh, like food or a company like like food and similar to this or were you so convinced about the trend pre-covid that that was more dominating could you could you elaborate a little bit on that what were your thought process in 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 that area that's a good question um yeah look I, the way i'll answer this question is i'll say that um you know obviously i live in the uk and as you guys probably know uk is probably one of the few countries one of the few markets in the world where the penetration of um, online groceries is actually reasonably high, relatively high, um, and and so I am and I have been a personal user of online groceries for a very long time. Um, you know, my family we we've been Ocado subscribers, uh, customers for many many years, um, and I've been obviously you know living in a big city. I've seen the food delivery takeaway mm -hmm. um, delivery businesses prosper um, and. Um, and and succeed and so 
I, um, you know, I, 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 I knew that this is an interesting space to, to look at um, and to consider regardless of coronavirus. And, and just so happened that obviously, you know, kind of, you know, if we, if we go back one year ago, um, you know, before the vaccine, before um, the light at the end of the tunnel, it was very unclear as to what the life, the normal life is going to look like for, for the, you know, for the foreseeable future. And so, um, and so that's what really prompted us to look at and just consider the growth, you know, kind of that online food space, online grocery space around the world, and just to see what's, what's there, what, what's out there. You know, that's not how we always generate ideas um, by sort of going top down, but we just simply wanted to go in and explore uh, and spend some time um, looking at different companies and, and, and reading up about different variations of the business models. So that's kind of how it, it it's a really, it's a combination of two. Okay. So, um, and, and what about, I mean, you could say um, we've had a lot of questions coming in both from, from listeners and when people are discussing food um, and the stock price of food and, and looking into the market cap of the company. So you guys came in and uh, with your fund in mid 2020, um, the first hundred percent plus uh, on your investment, you got like within the first six, seven, eight months, something like that. And, th and then could you put a little bit, a few words on how have you been viewing the development of the market cap of food since beginning of February down to, yeah, basically down to actually the, the Q3 uh, earnings call where, where the trend was really um, uh, negative coming from an all time high down to, down to a market cap of, I think, approximately 600 million Canadians um, were bottomed. Could, could you say a few words about how, how you viewed that development when being long in the stock um, and, and viewing uh, on it as a, as a long-term trend? Yeah, of course. Um, look, I, I mean, in that specific period, you know, going from March till, um, you know, the recent, the most recent call um, and, and, and the quarter, um, I mean, we've been adding to our position, you know, we've been mm. averaging down and, um, you know, I, I, you know, we, we've been consistently buying more stock because, um, simply because, you know, our, our horizon and, and, and the way that, the way that I think about good food is essentially we've underwritten it for a multiple, a number of years. We've underwritten it really for, let's say four or five or six years. Mm. Um, and we want to give the company this period of time to to go out there and to do it and to try and have a crack at the grocery market in the way that they've set out to do it and to give them an opportunity and a chance to um you know to gain a, a you know a, a meaningful share of both the online market as well as the actual total grocery market in canada which is immense as of course you guys know and so we really wanted just to kind of give them the opportunity um and of course these kind of big 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 challenges uh, big big goals are um, they never happen and they're never achieved in a straight line, um, and so you 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 will frequently have quarters and and sometimes years and just periods of time when you have um, you have some certain some hurdles or issues or operational teething issues in the business and and you know, scaling up uh, in a in a in a different business model or in a new business model is is always tough. Um, and so it, it was a given that it's going to take good food. Um, it's not going to be a straight line sort of growth and, and a, a sort of like a, a blue sky scenario where every year the stock will compound at, let's say, 40 percent and um, uh, mirroring the revenue growth. And, um, and you know, everything is going to be great uh, every quarter. I think, you know, it, it's challenges always happen. And so and, and so the reason why I kind of I say all of that is, is that, you know, basically from from February down to, to the summer, especially kind of towards the low end of the market cap, you mentioned 600 million Canadian dollars or thereabouts. That's roughly, you know, if we take out the cash, uh, if we take out the net cash of the company, that's kind of, you know, more or less one times the revenue run rate of the company. Mm. Um, and, and of course, it's a, it is a profitable business. Um, um, and so, you know, that, that felt like a really good level to be buying at. It's a, it feels like it felt like you know it feels and it, it felt and it continues to feel like you know there's a there's a decent amount of margin of safety which is that you basically have this established uh milk it subscription business which is um you know d you know dominant or quasi dominant it's very profitable underneath the investment they're doing in groceries and all you're paying for it is just one times revenues despite the fact that it's growing and it will continue to grow for um you know in the long run and and then you've got this potentially enormous option in the, in, the, in the shape of groceries which 
course is is kind of the real prize that that we're after and just so happens you're not really paying anything for it when when the market cap is 600 or thereabouts and so and so that's kind of how we thought about it so we you know that gave us the confidence to be buy more and of course you know we've been tracking company fairly closely we we've been interacting with you you know obviously with you guys and uh, and obviously you know uh, asking adam to um you know for updates on on the sku releases um and just trying to kind of see how how is it that they are executing on the ground what is it that they're doing that of course isn't going to be reflected by the share price i think you know what we want to do is we really just want to focus on on tracking and making sure that the business is doing is going in the right direction and and then it doesn't really matter what happens to the share price in the short term i think you know we, we, we buy we, we buy when there's opportunity Jimmy, that that's that 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 really sounds good. Everything you're describing there, and just from for Adam and I to understand, because we're coming in uh, from a private investor angle. What I think is fascinating about this part, by the way, I think if, um, uh, Adam Adam and I both, um, I think I know that Adam and I both have have also been hold, holding on to food and and adding uh, throughout this period. So a little bit similar to what you guys been doing. But how have, how is it that could you could you t- try to explain to me, being a private investor, how is it that the market which I mean, every textbook would say to me that, Jacob, you can't uh, uh, see something that the market doesn't see. Everything is priced in. Can you elaborate a little bit on how is it that the market throughout the period, February, March, April, May, towards the Q3 uh, earnings report that came out, how is it that the market basically and that short term seemed to um, undervalue food of approximately 40 to 50% compared to what trades uh, at current date? Um, do you understand my like puzzling question on that? How how is it that that, that the market hadn't priced in the current value of food? What, what is your uh, what? Yeah, what, yeah, I, I understand. Price? Yeah, Jacob, I, I understand your question. I think you, you, you know it's. I think your your question is you know it's again it's an important subject. It's uh, um, you know it's um, you know I, when I was a student at university, I wrote a dissertation on um, um, uh, market efficiency. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, I did a study of, uh, different forms of market efficiency and tried to kind of understand the different theories around it. And so, um, you know, the example, you, you know, the, the example of good food of the price gyrations of good food, um, is, is in such a short period of time, of course, is, is, is interesting because, you know, you, you have, you have a situation where, you know, as the old saying goes, you know, the value, value investors like to kind of bring up this example, which is that, you know, you, uh, you know, from from a from a quarter to quarter, or from a year to year, the actual change in the business tends to be very small. Whereas, you know, a lot of the time, you know, the changes in the share price tend to be quite dramatic, and um, you know, you, you you've got frequently swings in share prices, and and so you know, these are these are opportunities. And so I think as long as one has um, you know reasonably uh, you know stable capital, you know, if you're a private investor, if you if you if you've committed this you know if you've committed if you made the investments and you've committed your you know portion of your personal capital to to a stock and you don't have to pull out this money and, and use it for you know to, to, for any sort of living costs or expenses or to pay your rent or mortgage or whatever then as long as you have the staying power to keep on uh, you know staying in your investment while you know you still believe in your thesis but the share price is dislocated a, a lot then you know that's that's a, that's a really important power you, you, you know it's important and and i think that you know many institutional investors have a weakness there too you know they 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 freak out they see a share price going down they sell um because they they're afraid that um you know for, for them the, the share price drives the narrative um and and so you know and and so you know one of the reasons why i love um smaller companies and i love um you know kind of you know you know sub 2 billion market cap companies is because the degree of dislocation and degree of inefficiency in in those kind of areas of the market tends to be great you know it tends to be a lot greater than in in some of the much better covered stocks and much better covered industries and good food is a really really good example because essentially you have a company which is um you know fairly innovative you know they are they're an online um, grocery business um, that's trying to build its own private SKU range or private label. They're doing last mile logistics and they're doing that. Um, and they're doing that profitably, which is interesting and important. Um, and um, But you have no guarantee that the, the business is going to be able to achieve you know, a certain 
you know, you know, revenue figure, you know, maybe it's a 1 billion or 2 billion Canadian dollar revenue figure in a number of years. And, and so the market is, um, the market tends to get very pessimistic, optimistic at times, uh, you know, COVID this, COVID that, vaccine reopening, um, mm. you know, everyone, everyone was sitting at home and ordering groceries, all of a sudden everyone is out and going to restaurants. Um, therefore, um, you know, groceries, online groceries will decline and milk kits will decline. You'll have several quarters of bad revenues. And so we're sitting through it and we're thinking, well, you know, we have a long term case. We, you know, we've underwritten this business for a number of years. This doesn't really matter. You know, as long as the business is going in the right direction underneath all of that external noise and durations, it doesn't really matter. And, and that's what we try to focus on. And I think, you know, because you, your question was kind of, you know, from a standpoint of, you know, you know, you're a private investor um, and from a standpoint of a private investor, how is it possible that, you know, a, a, a public company which is covered by analysts um, and has institutional shareholders is, is, is as volatile as it is? And I think that that's, you know, that's you know, the reality is that the market you know, tends to tends to do that all the time in different parts of the world, um, in different companies and sectors. And, you know, as long as you're, you're a stable and grounded investor and you know why you're kind of, you know, why, why you're in it. And what you're in it, um, then you know you can you can convert these kind of situations or moments of uncertainty and volatility into into opportunity. I hope that that sort of answers your question. It, it yeah. definitely it definitely does, Jimmy. Uh, how how yeah. do you view that, Adam? I I don't know if that also pays into your thought process on food. Yeah, I think I I think I agree with uh, everything that uh, Jimmy said, and it's you know when you're looking at a small sub one billion Canadian dollar market cap like Good Food, there's gonna it's gonna be priced a lot less efficiently than you know a Facebook or a Google where there's hundreds of analysts you know following every single every single uh, day, right? So. Um, you know, that's but kind let of me, but let me let me let me rudely interrupt you there, Adam, which is interesting, you know, kind of the, the timing of what you just said, which is, you know, you have hundreds of analysts following stocks. Well, actually, ironically, that does happen. The same kind of dynamics do happen with stocks, massive companies, massive stocks, followed by tens, if not hundreds of analysts. And, you know, a good case in point is the Chinese Internet drama that we're seeing right now. And so that's that's kind of another good one. But that's that's a whole. Different yeah, that's metaphor. that 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 is. <laughs> That is true, and I guess that that's the benefit of being a like a private investor and, and being able to have a long term focus for for us at least is, you know, if if we can withstand the volatility, Jacob and I, you know, it's um, you know, it, the, you get quite a you get a quite a few uh, really great buying opportunities uh, when when you do experience that kind of volatility. Um, just going into the kind of what you were saying about, um, you know, how, how fast the company is moving and uh, talking about the opportunity that they have in uh, grocery, uh, 18 months ago or so, I think that Good Food didn't have any grocery SKUs at all, whereas today it has over a thousand. So they're moving very, very quickly. You said that you're in the UK where uh, online grocery is a lot more common than it is in many places in the world. How do you view the, you know, food delivery and, and online grocery as a sector? And I know you talked about this a little bit when you brought up Ocado, but do you have a general interest in it besides food, good food? Um, yeah, so look, I, I think that um, food delivery, grocery, online grocery as a sector is a super interesting space. I think there's, you know, the reason why it's so interesting is because there's lots of change and um, innovation taking place um, and that will continue for quite some time. And, and, and those kind of, you know, those periods of change and disruption are always super interesting. I, I think, you know, the, the TAMs, kind of the, the food slash grocery TAM total addressable market is, is, is very large in every country, you know, in, in Canada, with, in the case of good food, it's, you know, it's circa 130 billion Canadian dollars, which is massive. And so that's the ultimate prize that, um, you know, these companies are going for, certainly, or certainly some portion of that, of that prize. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a super interesting space. Um, and of course, as you guys know, there are different categories um, within food delivery, you know, there's, there's the on-demand, there's the convenience, there's takeaway, there's the full grocery, like Ocado, for example, and kind of like your, your full weekly shopping. Um, and the reality is that most of these companies are, you know, I, I think that they're, they're still yet to figure out how to scale their businesses profitably. 
um, and um, and you know, I the react you know my, my personal opinion is that I'm not sure whether many of these food delivery players, especially the convenience companies that you know the, these are private companies that have been popping up everywhere in Europe and in North America. I'm not sure whether they will be profitable unless there's going to be a, a very significant in-market consolidation where, you know, uh, the five or six players end up merging and, um, you know, some will go bankrupt, some will be bought out. And, and so you will end up just having, you know, maybe two two operators in the country and the market, and then they'll have to put up their prices a little bit. And then maybe then they can justify the um, their existence economically. Um, but right now, I think, you know, the, the biggest question really is, you know, who can do it profitably? Um, at scale um, and how and you know what's the shape of the industry going to look like in let's say five years time from now what, what's going to be the penetration of online grocery um, uh, and, and kind of how is that how is that online grocery market then going to be split between the incumbent supermarkets who have gone online and tried to do their own dark stores or store picking uh, versus these disruptive businesses that are trying to build something from scratch and that's a, that's a really interesting question and so you know, you know, me being in the UK, you know, UK um, online grocery penetration is one of the highest. China is another market market where it is very high, probably the highest in the world today. Um, um, and um, and and so that gives me the confidence. No, you know, kind of seeing that, uh, seeing uh, various uh, supermarket vans, um, you know, pop up on my street and and deliver groceries to my neighbors on a daily basis gives me the confidence that there's a real demand and there's a real need for, for that sort of service. And, and so eventually that will come to other markets, other countries. And, and of course, Canada, and the reason why I think, you know, Canada is interesting with good food is that you, you basically, you have a, of course, you have a very large country, you have a reasonably si reasonable population, but you have a pretty good degree of density of the population because so many people are, uh, you know, the majority of the people are based around the urban areas and, and the cities. And so it's, it's only a small portion of the country that's actually um, that's actually populated and, and fairly densely populated. And of course, that's that tends to be good for um, delivery businesses because you've got higher density and you can you can make it more you can make your delivery more profitable or you can make it profitable faster. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's a kind of a very long-winded answer to your question. I, I, I do think it's an interesting space. I, I try to, um, I try to be very selective, um, and I would want to be very selective here because um, there, there are not that many public companies that are or that give you that sort of exposure, um, and you really want to sort of look through what's out there and, and, and really have confidence and conviction that. Um, that one particular business is really going to have a good future and and a profitable future eventually, and so that's why that's why you know essentially you know of all the companies that I'm familiar with globally that are essentially grocery players, my preferred one is Good Food. Again, this isn't investment advice; this is just my opinion. But kind of on on the merits of it, I, I do I do prefer Good Food. Jimmy, that's that's uh, that's an interesting note you finish off there. I don't know how you guys view it, both you and uh, Adam and, and and Jimmy. But when touching upon the sector here, I mean, we've obviously seen some investor hypes in 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 different sectors that are also often not justified. I mean, we we uh, well, not justified. That sounds maybe wrong, but we've seen a lot of hype in sectors like uh, EV, green energy. Uh, uh, at one point, marijuana, uh, plant based. Uh, uh, meat and so on. So a lot of sectors that have really enjoyed a lot of uh, and, and probably too fast and too much uh, uh, of the investors uh, focus. An area like online groceries, like you say, seems to be such an uh, underpenetrated uh, sector currently ac across the, uh, the globe. Do you have any thoughts on why is it that, um, that, that investors haven't really uh, fallen in love with this sector yet? Because you touched a little bit upon it when you talk about how, how a profitable business model looks like in the future. You also mentioned that good food currently trades at a forwarded EV sales of, uh, of one or something like one to one with, uh, with the current enterprise value. Could you, put, could you elaborate a little bit on that? I don't know if you follow my question in, in, in those terms. Why is it that yeah. the general market isn't, isn't totally, I mean, I, the three of us could probably over these two cups of coffee and a beer, and the Sicilian beer could be really become hyped up around, around food and we are. Why is it that the market in general doesn't doesn't uh, forward in uh, those uh, um, uh, yeah that that business model into the current valuation of, of the sector? 
Yeah, yeah, that's another really good question. Um, look, I mean, my honest answer is I don't quite know, um, and that, that would tend to be, a, you know, my answer for a lot of these sort of like you know market-related questions. You know, why why isn't market pricing this or that? And, you know, <laughs> Fair time, answer, by the way. Know, yeah. I, I don't know, but I mean, but I can give you my thoughts on that. You know, exactly. And I do yeah. have certain views and opinions, and 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 so you know, of course, you know, I um, I think about it a lot. Um, the reality is that you know, this is <laughs> it's interesting. No one really knows this company, even though um, you know, outside of Canada, not many people know about it. And so, um, you know, I was joking recently that I, I was I was saying to someone um, that you know, I must be like you know that you know I, I must be like their only institutional shareholder outside of Canada. <laughs> uh, which you know now I know it's not true, um, but um, but it is you know it's interesting. The business doesn't really have much visibility. It's it doesn't really it doesn't really screen well, you know, because the company doesn't um, doesn't look like a very profitable business. Because of course they're reinvesting back into trying to grow the the grocery side. Um, they are very small. You know the you know the six hundred Canadian dollar market cap which we've had recently is is only like you know it's it's less than half a billion U.S. dollars. So it's it's a it's a tiny company, especially for the institutions. Um, and, and so it just simply doesn't flash up. You know, it's interesting, you know, and also kind of Canada um, is, is, isn't, you know, uh, isn't kind of one of these kind of key focal developed markets. Um, you know, it doesn't have, you know, it, it does have its own domestic institutional base, but it's not, you know, it's not huge and it's not that well established as maybe the US. Um, and, and so, um, so yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a not very liquid, um, small cap company in Canada operating in Canada. They're trying this experimental business model, which is, you know, they're obviously, you know, you know, they, they did this milk and subscription, which has worked. Um, and now they are literally allocating majority of their capital and rechanneling their capital and their efforts into um, this new business line, which is yet to be proven to be successful, even all three of us have a lot of conviction that it it should work, mm -hmm. and it's likely to work. Um, but not many people seem to know it or seem to want to care about it. And but that happens often, you know, that happens a lot, a lot of the time in, in markets, which is why I think you know it, it's important to be able to have that longevity of being able to of of, of staying power in, in in an investment. And so you know, with with a stock like Good Food, you really want to. You know, if you believe in the in a bright long term future of their grocery business, you really want to give yourself a few years um, to be able to capture that. Because what happens in the next couple of months, quarters, maybe even year or two, it's really hard to predict. And so I think that's that's the reality. So I think it's just it's you know it's it just a lot less efficiency down that kind of end of the market cap and small business experimental business model, or what seems like a highly experimental risky business model um, to an outsider. Yeah, exactly. Because just to, um, and obviously time is also running, so we really want to touch in on, on other topics with you. But the, the, your concluding remark there is interesting because we noticed, Adam and I, that analysts also covered these questions in, in the Q&A part of the earnings calls. What we, the three of us, agree on and view on as a, as a great strategic leap forward with, with, with a strategic decision to go online groceries heavy, like Good Food is doing, is a big part of their business model. Um, the analysts seem to to view it also uh, uh, everything i mean in in life is a risk reward right and we are the three of us are talking a lot about the reward side of going online groceries it seems that the market is pricing in perhaps the risk of it what happens if this does not become a success with online groceries uh, do you view it the same way that that it seems that analysts have been really focused on the risk side of the online groceries putting investment into something that is not yet proven and thereby perhaps having difficulties in justifying a, a higher valuation for, for food because they more tend to focus on the risk side of it? No, uh, good question. I, 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 like, I like your questions, guys. They're very, very thoughtful, very intelligent. Um, look, I, I, I started my career as, a, as an analyst. I, I worked for a big bank um, and I was covering stocks and, you know, I've kind of, I've done it myself. And, you know, all I'm going to say is, um, you know, um, I, I, I can really see why analysts um, tend to get things, you know, tend to be late um, on picking up or noticing significant trends or um, being able to spot certain big ideas. I, very few people are, are good at that, uh, especially when they work for a bank and there's a there's a sort of a career risk attached to it. Um, 
but no, you, no. Look, I mean, I think your your assessment of how the analysts tend to view good food is probably right. I think that they don't want to give the they don't want to sort of embed and, and pay up for the optionality of the success of the grocery business, and they they want to be cautious and and simply try and value what is there today, what's obvious and kind of what's in front of them. They're not really willing to look around the corner and kind of see what's out there, um, and. And, and so, um, and that, that kind of, that tends to be the source or, or one of the sources of the opportunity. And, and so I love it. I love it when that happens because, you know, if we can, if we can, you know, part of the reason why I love the good food situation so much is that, you know, we are, you know, we're trying to think about what the business is going to look like in five years time. This is, this is the example of, you know, of this, of this concept called, you know, or named destination invest, investing popularized by Nick Sleep, which is obviously, you know, a, 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 a big guru of mine. Um, he, you know, he, he, he said, you know, he, the way that he always tried to do things is he, when he was looking at, a, at an, at an interesting, um, uh, business that is growing and developing, uh, in, in, in developing fast is, is he tried to picture what it's going to look like, in, let's say in five or 10 years down the line, what is this business going to look like? And, um, how is it going to get there? And what is, what is, what is likely to stop this business from getting there? And he was trying to ask these kind of questions. And so when he was meeting management of companies, he would really try to um, essentially channel and steer the conversation onto those areas, which is, you know, not he wasn't really asking about the quarter or the year and the guidance and all of this stuff. He was really trying to understand, well, what are you doing with this business? Where are you taking it? What's it going to look like in five to 10 years time? How are you going to get there? And what's going to prevent you from getting there? And so... And to me, that's a really useful framework. And obviously I've internalized it a long time ago and I try to use it in, in sort of in, in many of my investment case studies. Um, and I think Goodfoot is a really good example, which is, you know, we're trying to, all three of us here, we have a mental concept of what Goodfoot should look like, let's say in five or six years from today. Um, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not clear and it's risky and it's uncertain. Um, but that's where we're trying to get to and that's where we're trying to we're truly trying to underwrite and i think that you know with 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 a lot of professional investors and i think a lot of the the sell side analysts at banks you know they their job really is just to kind of you know just to see what's what you know what's in front of you what's a safe answer you know what's a safe recommendation career risk as i, as I mentioned is a big input there and so you know that's just tends to be a really good source of inefficiency and opportunity you know if you can you know, if, 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 if I can have 15 good foods or let's say 15 or 17 good foods, which are spread around the world and they have, they have a lot of these characteristics of good food, which is you have like very, very interesting, highly motivated visionary management who have skin in the game, who are building an excellent culture. Um, they have a really sensible strategy for what this business is going to look like in five to 10 years down the line. And the valuation you're paying for is quite modest, which is effectively just you know, essentially you just, you just buying the existing business you can see today, which is milk and you're paying nothing or zero for, for that grocery, that big potential, um, kind of perspective, you know, this perspective part of good food, um, then that's really excellent. That's, you know, I, I would love to have these kind of those 15 good foods and just build a portfolio around them. And, and, um, that would be the Holy grail. The reality is, is it's hard to find them, but when you do, it's, it's a really good opportunity usually. Love that answer uh, a lot, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, being long term and, and not focusing on, you know, the, the current valuation and, and the current declines that and the volatility that we experience, uh, you know, I, I really resonate with uh, kind of trying to imagine what the business is going to be like in, in five to 10 years and not what it's like today. I know that you've given some predictions, um, you know, on the company, you know, five or 10 years down the road. Uh, in order to achieve kind of your expectations for the future, what are some of the key initiatives that they're going to need to succeed on? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for the question, Adam. Um, yeah, look, I, I think, you know, I would say probably two or three things. Um, I think, you know, kind of in the, in the near term, and I think that, you know, obviously, you know, the aspect that I'm trying to track closely now is is, um, is 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 good food really gaining traction and gaining strong traction with their private label SKUs with customers across the main urban areas of Canada. And I think that that's a real make or break for their ability to succeed in groceries. You know, can they, 
Um, can they come up with really interesting, successful pro products that resonate well with the with our target customer base? Um, and so, and so, so if these products do appeal due to their superior quality, branding, price, then Good Food really has a chance of taking some good share of the grocery market in Canada. So I think that's that's kind of the number one thing. You know, that's the, the number one initiative I would be looking at. Um, um, I think secondly, I would say, you know, it's it's the rollout of the last mile logistics. Um, so, you know, you have to really cover, uh, you know, Canada coast to coast eventually and, 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 and improve the density of the logistics. And that will allow them to significantly improve delivery times as well as the overall experience to customer. Um, and so and so that will allow them to keep the service highly competitive against the likely attempts by the big grocers to target online uh, online groceries and and simply to help them delight the customers more and more and better and better um and and that's 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 a crucial part of their strategy and i think that's something that we really have to watch as an initiative um thankfully um you know good food rolling out and increasing the share of their own logistics and delivery has actually been very creative to their margins and profitability, which has been very impressive. And I think the last last point I would just say, which I think is still important is that, you know, they need to successfully scale up the operation, um, but to do so, you know, but not just grow, but, but to actually grow in a profitable manner, um, despite the inherent complexity of the supply chain, the last mile delivery and what they're trying to build. It's a really, ultimately they're building a really complex business. And so they need to make sure that the gross margin at the very minimum stays at the current levels um, 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 and hopefully grows uh, as they can scale uh, because that will allow them to generate an attractive return on capital and eventually to generate cash and to be able to decide how to allocate that cash whether they eventually want to return it to shareholders when they are much more mature or whether they have other interesting initiatives to deploy it to. But, you know, I think really it's just kind of those two things and, and really is in, in that kind of priority um, from where we're sitting today. Is that also then, Jimmy, to elaborate on that uh, coming from strategic initiatives down to the PNL, you guys are, are in it for the long run. Uh, uh, with the fund, you definitely talk about five to 10 years perspective. When you're following food on the earnings quarter to quarter level, and you're obviously also following it more uh, more often than that, and you have a dialogue with management and and uh, and you review your uh, your position and so on and, and, and view the case as an investment uh, case, what, what are like the key initiatives you look at uh, in terms of the P&L uh, ongoing and what sort of signs are you looking at from how the, the business is developing? I think you you basically touched upon it when you said gross margin right now. So I assume you would probably answer that. But but what is it that that is like the key initiatives for the case to be proven uh, in terms of of heading towards that five to ten year uh, uh, goal which you're aiming at? Um, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think from a PNL standpoint, I think you know if I was to kind of summarize and simplify my answer and, and kind of um, try to give a, a, a really brief answer to start with, I would be looking for the, the revenue, I'll be looking at the gross margin, and I would want to be looking at the operating margin of the company. And so, you know, ideally, you want to see them being able to grow revenue at a, at a healthy pace, driven by basket size increases, order frequency growth, as well as, of course, new customer additions. So, you know, revenue growth is, is, is ultimately going to be a fundamental driver for this business and, you know, and, and, and understanding what's driving the revenue. Why, why, you know, why is it growing 20% or 30%? Kind of what's, what's driving that? What's the mix that's driving that is, is quite important. And I think, you know, gross margin, as you've just alluded to, is super important because gross margin in the retail business um, is, is going to dictate its ability to ultimately be profitable in the net net profit, net cash flow, net free cash flow kind of level. Um, and so far, I have to say that Good Food has been doing a really, really a tremendous job and I'm very happy with how it's been going um, at the gross margin level. I think they um, that they really keep on surprising. Um, um, and, 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 and then, you know, I would say operating margin is important, but operating margin is currently depressed. And that's not really an accurate reflection of the underlying profitability potential of the company. And so you know, as, as you guys know, it's depressed because the management are prioritizing investments into the grocery operations. So mm -hmm. they're, they're adding headcount, building logistics infrastructure, they're kitting out the new warehouses, 
they're investing in IT systems, customer acquisition costs, and all of that. And so, and so today, and that's that's why I said that that stock, the stock doesn't screen very well if you if you're just going to screen for it quantitatively because you know you have really low levels of underlying profitability, uh, really low levels of reported profitability. But that's that's all very explainable and. You want them to be investing in these things. You want them to be spending money. And unfortunately, they have, you know, the company has enough capital and it's it's quite self-sufficient. Um, and so um, they're doing all the right things. And so I think, you know, in the long run, I would probably want to see them reach, let's say, you know, a circa a 10% operating margin. Um, and I think that will be a good result for a grocery business. Um, uh, but, you know, but then, you know, I guess your, your question was, was about the PNL. Mm. I would just add one thing to what I said, which is that, you know, obviously the cash flow statement is, is also quite important because, you know, that allows you to see the underlying, you know, you know, how, what's the cash profitability of the business? Does, does, is, is it actually profitable? Uh, and, and what's the working capital efficiency of the company? And so for a retail business, uh, working capital um, um, and, and kind of, you know, and the cash flow that's tied in it is, is, is tends to be quite important. And so, you know, for example, the pace of inventory turnover, uh, super important. Good food, thankfully, been very good at it. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of my answer. Yeah, awesome. And when you're looking into the revenue, as um, as also you mentioned as as being as being a key, then you must have been really excited when you saw the Q three free earnings report, especially going into when you're talking about basket size and frequency, which were uh, which were driving really the revenue growth from Q two to Q three. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by that. Uh, as you say, um, I was also quite impressed by the gross margin. Uh, uh, my colleague and I, we were just, you know, we were looking at each other and, uh, we were stunned by, you know, by, by how much the, the gross margins have improved. Um, but, um, but, but you know, oh, I mean, quarter- yeah, Jimmy, would, yeah. would you actually call that a little bit like the, the canary in the coal mine? I mean, if we look at the, the former, uh, earnings calls, it, it didn't seem that that people outside of food, and I'm thinking about the analysts, were so interested in what could online groceries uh, start evolve to. And would you say that this was like the first quarter where we saw a little bit the canary in the coal mine, seeing that w- what can this be? I mean, what sort of effects can we see on the gross margin when we see uh, the effects on basket size and frequency? Uh, yeah, look, it's an uh, interesting point. Um, maybe, yeah, perhaps you, you could say that, uh, you could say that, um, I think that, look, I mean, you know, taking a step back, my, you know, my, you know, thinking, you know, thinking to how we thought about good food a year ago initially was that, um, you know, we really thought that groceries are likely to be margin dilutive in the first, let's say, one or two or three years of the companies um, of the company focusing on that business line because they're trying to ramp it up, they're trying to scale up and um, and roll roll out the service across um, across Canada and um, and and so I you know and and that's why that's what, that was really our surprise that you know actually you know we, instead of seeing dilution to the margin we've seen a really you know kind of a bit of uplift but then again you know we have to be realistic and we have to just say well that's just one single quarter. Um, mm. And of course, you know, in, 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 in fast growing businesses, you can have wonderful quarters, you can have awful quarters. It's important to stay grounded and not get overly excited when you have one, you know, explosive growth quarter or whatever, super high margins, and don't get depressed when you have one terrible quarter. You just have to understand what's really going on under the bonnet. Are they doing the right things? Are they really trying? Are they knocking out and rolling out the right number of SKUs? Uh, how's that going? What's the traction like? What's the availability like on the platform? Um, on the website, um, on the app, which, by the way, has been really good. Um, as you guys, as you guys have been observing, it's, it's it's had very good rankings. And so, it really is comes down to you know really tracking uh, the offering, the quality of the offering, the pricing. And we try to look at prices and and see whether how do they compare. You know, are they sensible compared to the local um, incumbent supermarkets and other online delivery services? Um, and then, you know, margins, you know, margins, we can only see from their reports and, 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 um, and the quarterly statements, but, um, but yeah, you know, so far, I think what's important is that, you know, things are going in the right direction. We have to be grounded. We just, you know, not get too ahead of ourselves, um, um, about, you know, that one incredible quarter. But then, uh, but then Jimmy just loosely interpreted what I hear you say is that you're actually more focused on the fundamentals than you are on tracking the PL from quarter to quarter. That's also what I hear you say, right? You're more interested in 
in in the ground case and and the things that are going to pay into your long term business case in then then what happens short term in 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 the PNL? Yeah, no, that's 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 a fair statement. No, absolutely. And 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 but I think you know. But having said that, you know, I I just want to caveat myself by saying that ultimately these quarterly p &L, um releases or whatever, you know, financial statements and, and the presentation and ability to get the qualitative information from the management, they give you the confirmation and that gives you the evidence mm -hmm. um, that, you know, actually what they're doing on the ground works or it's succeeding and they are having that traction and they are getting that new uh, warehouse and that warehouse is now getting good coverage and it's operating and it's covering X num extra number of households and 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 the deliver the own delivery share is grown from X percent to so and so and and that seems to be miraculously actually accretive to the margin. So all these things are conf confirmatory to kind of that daily or you know that that sort of like that that regular execution thesis. So no, I mean yeah, you you make a good point. Oh, that's great, Jimmy. Sorry, I'll just I'll just step in here. And uh, something to note about the gross margins is that uh, they actually are really high compared to the rest of the industry. But as they do this investment, I, I personally actually expected gross margins to to drop a little bit in the previous quarter, as they're doing a lot more investment in their private label grocery, and and that's becoming a a, a larger part of revenue. So that you know goes along with. You know, speculating quarter to quarter, uh, I personally expected gross margins to still be pretty good, but to drop slightly, and and they actually increased their gross margin as they're rolling out more and more uh, private private label uh, SKUs. So, um, you know, it, in, in terms of the metrics that that you track, you know, um, gross margin being very important, but of course, like you said, there's there's so many more fundamental. Uh, you know things to within the company that are uh what to be looking for like we said like the app downloads and uh pricing comparisons to uh local grocery stores those are the things that are going to drive the success of the company long term as well as uh you know the income and, and uh income statement and uh yeah i you know i really like your your thinking there um good point I, good point adam yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe we can ask a fun question now. And as we kind of uh, begin to wrap up, this has been a really great conversation. I've learned so much. Uh, Jimmy, I know that in the past you've made some comparisons to Trader Joe's, and I, and I believe you've recommended a book as well to some of us about the story of Trader Joe's. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what Trader Joe's is to, to investors uh, who might not be in the States and might not know what they are and kind of how does it resemble good food uh, in your opinion? Yeah, sure. No, it's uh, it's, it's, it's again, you know, good question. Yeah, look, I, I, it's, um, you know, we've been trying to figure out, well, who is it that good food are trying to um, model themselves on or who, who are they trying to emulate? Because I think that's, you know, this is, you know, usually when I meet management, I, I like to ask them this question, which is, you know, who do you admire as a, uh, you know, who, what are the, who are the um, other management teams you admire? Who are the other business people you think very highly of? And, um, and, um, and of course, you know, uh, Ferrari, uh, CEO of Good Food, uh, you know, he, his role model is, is, is a, is a recently deceased um, businessman called Tony Sierra. Uh, who um, who was the founder of Zappos in the U.S. and who sold Zappos to Amazon, um, you know, some years ago. Um, and Zappos was an interesting business. And 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 Tony actually wrote this book called Delivering Happiness. Um, uh, I think it's, it's called Delivering Happiness: uh, Path to Profits, Passion, and Purpose, or something like that. Um, and um, one of the central pieces of the culture of of Zappos um has really been just trying to delight your customer trying to really you know do your best to provide an awesome service to, to deliver a really good product awesome service really good customer service and just in the really good overall experience and and um and that really shines and really comes through through and through good food whatever you know in in our due diligence on the company that really has been coming through really well um, um you know they you know for example you know they, they tend to fully reimburse some of the customers you know the customers who uh, would have had, uh, you know, 
an accidental bad experience with their meal kit delivery and they, they called and they complained and instead of good food um you know giving them part credit or something good food would just fully refund them for that order which was uh you know many people would say that's really stupid because you you, you know you you're losing your margins there you know you you know effectively it's like you know these returns for an e-commerce business um but good food kept on doing it and still doing that because they you know they think it's the right way to treat the customer um and that culture is um super important and 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 so trader joe's is is another example of a business that um you know it's it's another one of these kind of role model businesses that um ferrari is is trying to uh, emulate slash model themselves on you know trader joe's of course is a, is an offline only business it's a it's a specialty, you know. It's it's a supermarket. Uh, it's a chain of supermarkets in 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 the U.S. Uh, privately owned, has been going on for a long time. Super successful, um, and they have an interesting strategy, which is essentially, you know, they 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 also tend to focus on private label products, their own private label grocery products, um, and um, they do tend to provide really impeccable customer service. They treat their stuff really well. They pay them good wage. Um, and overall, you know, kind of every echelon of the company, every layer of the company is built with the right culture in mind. Um, and the sim there are many similarities between them and Good Food, and, and or certainly there are many aspects of that business that Good Food managers have taken on to try and replicate and emulate. And I think that's the totally right thing to do. And, you know, some of them are the really obvious ones, like, for example, you know, based on the examples of the SKU groceries you've personally purchased and you've sampled and you've tried some of them look really amazing and some of them sound really awesome uh, i mean you kind of your feedback's been really good um and and my impression and correct me if i'm wrong is that you can't really get many of these products in in your typical supermarket you know whether it's sobeys or loblaws or maybe some of the other kind of smaller chains they are really kind of these kind of unique or quasi unique products and that's what trader joe's is really good at you know they really come come up with these interesting you know, an interesting cake or an interesting recipe or an interesting kind of pack of ribs or something, which you you really can't get anywhere else. And, you know, people in New York would really go across the city and they would take the subway, you know, across across town just to get that particular cake, just to get that particular product because they love it so much. And and that's kind of that almost like a cult following. And, and I think that that's what Good Food is trying to create. And, you know, I think so far, you know, so far, I think they are, uh, you know, they, they seem to be doing a good job. Um, and and that, that, that gives me the confidence that if they keep on focusing on these on the right elements, which is to delight the customer, to have a really good culture in place, and just to focus on keeping the customer happy and offering an impeccable service and keep on improving it, eventually, they'll get there. And eventually, this business can actually capture quite a decent share of the overall grocery market in Canada um, and that's the real price you know again you know that's kind of the real upside and optionality we could be looking at in the long run Jimmy that is a, that is a great um, a great case you bring forward with Trader Joe's uh, where, that they just put up forward there G Jimmy on a on a conclusive uh, remark here I know this is a little bit more of a populistic question but you touched a little bit upon it when looking at um, at your business investment strategy from your from your from the fund side. Um, if you look at food from a five or 10 year perspective, what, what would be your, like your worst and base and best case for food in terms of valuation? And again, being this, just, just your, your personal opinion. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I'll, again, you know, I'll re caveat myself by saying this is not investment advice because mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I'm just kind of giving my, my feel and my opinion about it. Um, but look, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'll just kind of, I'll take a step back and I'll say, um, I think that, you know, or certainly the way that I look at good food is that I don't think that we should be looking at good food in a static manner. Um, the business is, of course, rapidly evolving, it's growing, it's changing shape. And so I think that it's rather self-limiting to try and put a static target price on the company. And then, you know, let's say to sell the share, the shares when the share price hits that target price. Um, I think in reality, we have to be tracking the development of the company. We have to see evidence of them taking share of the grocery market hopefully um and if it all works if they can continue executing like they have been i think that there's really there's a potential of them becoming a huge company they can become a a very large business um and 
I think the way I would think about it, you know, I, I will just say, you know, look, I mean, I can paint, I can try and do like a back of envelope, um, kind of like a best case uh, or blue sky scenario, which is, you know, let's say right now, Canadian grocery market is um, the size of the Canadian grocery market is approximately $130 billion. Let's say it's growing two or two and a half percent a year. And so in seven years time, it's going to compound to be approximately approximately 150, 150 billion market. Um, and let's then say, okay, well, what, what percentage of this market is going to be online groceries um, in IE in seven years from now? Well, it could be 25%. Let's say again, blue sky scenario. I mean, it can be 25%, it's possible. So 25% of the 150 billion markets. Um, and then let's ask ourselves a question. Well, what, what share of that online grocery market could good food represent? Um, well, in the blue sky scenario, I think they could represent, let's say a 15% share of the online grocery market. I mean, it's possible one, five, 15%. And so if that really happens and, um, we're really sitting there in seven years time, then we can be looking at a company with a market cap of, you know, let's say somewhere between eight to 12 billion Canadian dollars. Mm. And that's a 10 bagger plus, uh, mm. potentially again, you know, that's, that's, that's how we can get to that scenario. And I think that's a plausible scenario. I'm not, I'm not. I'm assuming I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that certainly is a possibility. And so that's kind of like a realistic best case scenario. I think in terms of worst case scenario, I think what could really happen is that you basically have a case where management failed to get sufficient traction in private label. Perhaps it's just much harder to, to scale up profitably, or maybe the competition has really become very extreme because tons of capital have flooded into the online grocery market. Um, and so if that happens and they kind of really failed to do a profitable grocery business and, and at scale, then, you know, we can just say that, you know, if the milk business continues to grow and develop at a reasonable pace, then, you know, you, you basically, you have, you have the milk business, which is worth something. And I would argue, you know, your current market cap is kind of circa the fair value for the milk business based on where the comparables are and, and kind of the long-term direction of that business. And, and the relatively cozy structure of the market in Canada, because you only have, you know, essentially two sizable players who shouldn't be competing too aggressively with each other, because that's just, that would be somewhat irrational, um, because the market is concentrated. Um, and so, yeah, so in the worst case now, you really are just left with a milk kit business that's worth probably, you know, you could say somewhere close to the current market cap plus minus, you know, uh, some sort of percentage um and and then you know and then you know if the management really really do fail um to grow groceries which i again i think it's unlikely um there'll be an excellent acquisition target either for a big re retailer in canada or maybe even amazon um who you know would be potentially interested in in, in buying this business um and so i think you know if that if that's the case your downside doesn't look particularly great and so that's again you know that that goes back to kind of what we are trying to find you know in, in our you know in our in our business uh you know our slash funds you know what what is it that we're trying to do we're trying to find a, a relatively small number of single name investments where you know if we're right we can have a double in you know two three years and, and ideally you have significant optionality where um there's a multi-bagger potential in a stock but if we're wrong and if we get it completely wrong and, and it's disappointing, um, then at least we don't lose very much money. So that's kind of the holy grail of what we're trying to find. Um, and that's, you know, I think if we kind of quality, you know, ticks a lot of these boxes, uh, certainly the way that I'm assessing it and, and I'm looking at it as it, 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 it falls into that category. That sounds great, Jimmy. And thanks a lot for, for giving uh, your thoughts and review on, on the figures on, on, a, on, a, uh, on a blue sky case for a seven-year perspective, the numbers you just uh, broke down. And that uh, that just sounds lovely, doesn't it, Adam? It really sounds like something with confidence that you can even add, uh, we can even add to our positions at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I don't plan to, I'm sure that I'll be adding to this over time. It's, uh, you know, one of my top positions and I have high conviction in it. Like I said, I, I use the product, uh, you know, I'm a, a meal kit subscriber and, and I, I've tried a lot of the private label grocery items and I try to try new items, uh, you know, pretty often. Uh, like, like Jimmy said, you know, they, they really do have some real specialty items that you can't find anywhere else. And 
they really do try to delight the customer. Uh, I can just share like a cool anecdote um, that I don't think I've shared with either of you before or our, our fans. And uh, my sister actually, and as well as a few other members of my family uh, have been uh, good food subscribers uh, and some friends, but my sister lives in like a, like a multi-unit apartment and they were delivering boxes to her house and her neighbor was actually like <laughs> taking, they saw this like food box. So they would like take it into their own house for like two days. And my sister would, wouldn't realize like, why are, why are boxes like showing, saying that they're delivered and then like <laughs> showing up two days later. So her, their neighbor were like taking them into like their living room or something for like a day or two. And then leaving them in front of my sister's door, like two, three days after they'd been delivered. And of course, like there's raw meat and stuff and things are spoiled. So she reached out to the, uh, you know, the loyalty team and they were refunding her. Like, even though she was getting the, they must've thought she was nuts or something. Cause she was like, these, these boxes aren't showing up for two days, but they don't really ask any questions. They were just, you know, crediting her or sending her, you know, new products and, you know, she eventually figured out the issue, luckily, that a neighbor was temporarily, uh, you know, storing her her food. But yeah, it's just a special company and, and they're very customer centric. Their, their products are very special. Even the packaging is just kind of designed to, I think, surprise and delight their customers. Uh, re- really appreciate you coming on to talk, Jimmy. And uh, if you could just let let us know the name of that book, uh, the Trader Joe's book that you've recommended. Yeah, it's called um, it's called Build a Brand Like Trader Joe's. I'm not saying it's a really good book that you guys absolutely must go and get. It's uh, it's not it's imperfect. It was just kind of the only available um, book on, on on the subject um, out there. But but you know, look the way that what I'd recommend is you know if you want to learn more about Trader Joe's, I would just go on YouTube and just try and watch a few of the sort of videos slash interviews and documentaries. There's a few really good ones about us um, that really just talk about that experience and, and sort of what's, what's different and what's unique about them compared to everyone else. And, and then you, you'll really see a lot of the parallels uh, between them and good food. Um, and, and so, so yeah, so that's, that's a really good starting point. You guys, awesome, really, yeah, Thank yeah, you. really, really, really been in um, insightful. This also regarding Trader Joe's. I think that was just one of the perspective. I, I've also noticed you talked about this on on Twitter before and on, on Discord, um, uh, Jimmy, but never really paid enough attention to that angle of the business. That that also pays in some some uniqueness and and something that's really becomes uh, difficult to attack from from the incumbents. Uh, I would also say the way you're describing it there. Completely right. No, exactly. And, and I think, you know, as, as you say, it's, uh, it's that uniqueness slash, it's that defensiveness. And, and ultimately, you know, if I may use the word moat around the business, you know, with, with good food, I'm really looking for two sources of moat ultimately, which is one is that they really build out this incredible range of private label, you know, SKUs that you just can't find anywhere else. Um, and that's what that, that's what will ultimately keep you know customers coming and, and kind of repeating their orders and and, and becoming loyal um you know hopefully subscribing purchases purchasers and customers um so that's one and, and two it's it's that logistics and that sort of smooth delivery fast delivery uh efficient delivery i think is going to make them very hard to compete with once they've been able to achieve that sort of you know once once they they're able to get through a few milestones um and so um so so yeah look i i and i and i think that you know you know again you know trade joe's the reason why it's important is that trade joe's have shown that their model really works which is you know a relatively limited selection of skus um mostly private label um and and that business really does work you know it does work and, and it's been it's been around for many decades and um, there's a cult like following. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, that's, that's a real precedent and that's a real example of, of, of a real life example of what good food are trying to create. Cool, Jimmy. So uh, on that note, uh, like Adam said before, thanks a lot for, uh, for coming on board on the, on the show on, on coffee and food. And then we hope you enjoy your b- beer. I know I joined my, my coffee. I don't know about you, Adam. Yeah, my coffee was great. I'm, I'm wired now, so <laughs> great. And this was just yeah. And this was just so cool to get a, a professional um, insight into good food with your close relation um, 
uh, Jimmy to management and to following the case from from uh, from the investment side of your fund. So thanks a lot. Uh, a great shout out to you for being on board um, and to everybody out there. If you feel like uh, following more on Jimmy, that was like what Adam said. You can find him on his Twitter handle at DZ, that's D-E-E-Z-E-E, -E -E -E, 1031. So um, thanks a lot uh, to both of you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. I hope I hope I was uh, I was helpful in any way. Uh, oh, you were you were amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, really appreciated uh, coming on and, and chatting with us. Any time, guys. Wow, Adam, great talk we just had with Jimmy, where we shared uh, our, our thoughts on food uh, over a beer and some coffee. How did you view the whole talk with Jimmy? That was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much, Jimmy, for, for coming on and talking to us. To me, it was really interesting uh, to view Jimmy's case and how similar it is to, to yours and mine. He's, you know, hedge fund manager, but focused on the fundamentals and, and the long-term, uh, you know, uh, goal and, and vision for the company. And, you know, he is a, a wealth of knowledge on, uh, you know, being in the UK, you know, so much about the Canadian food industry. It was really interesting to hear. How about yourself? Yeah. I, I also had the big takeaway similar to yours that it's, uh, greatly appreciated to hear a professional um, investor like Jimmy, um, how he views the good food case and how there are so many similarities in the same way you and I talk about food. Um, I think that gives great comfort to private investors that that they can view a case uh, and the fundamentals in a very, very similar, similar matter. And then I also enjoyed really a lot the whole um, view on food in relation to uh, the resemblance it has with Trader Joe's in the US. I think that was a great bit um, and something that I really, I mean, we talked about this before you and I with with Jimmy offline, but but I think that's something that definitely is uh, is valuable to take away also from this from this session right here. Yeah, I think that uh, our viewers will really enjoy this. And, you know, this was our very first interview that we've done. And hopefully we can do more in the future and talk to more uh, food experts. Thank you so much, Jacob. Likewise, Adam. Take care.